Hello, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, I know that we have people joining from all around the world, and uh, uh, this is especially uh, good news, and I'm especially happy to tell you that uh, we have about 500 registered participants from all around the world, and this is uh, officially the largest arbitration event in Eastern Europe uh, to have ever happened. So this is the what kind of wonders can happen uh, with video links and uh, with Zoom and, uh, and uh, other contemporary uh, features that we will also discuss today in relation to arbitration. Uh, we have a very distinguished uh, group of speakers, and of course, uh, these are the people why uh, we, who have attracted you to join, and I'm really grateful for them for making the time uh, to speak. And uh, this event is organized uh, with the support of the Baltic States chapter of uh, the Chartered, Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. Um, and this, uh, the speakers here, most of the speakers here, are unified by their connection with the International Arbitration Academy. And uh, generally, I'm really proud to tell you that uh, this uh, event uh, is an idea of my colleagues uh, Agle and Tadas, who are alumni of International Arbitration Academy. And they had an idea to gather uh, other alumni and professors and founders, actually, uh, of the International Arbitration Academy and to discuss the impact of uh, the COVID-19 crisis on arbitration and how it's going to, we all has, uh, have seen how it changes our lives uh, generally and the business lives and the professional lives and, and how it changes arbitration. Uh, this is the subject of our discussion today. Um, we are all another thing that uni that unites uh, the speakers is uh, we are all young arbitrators uh, some of us uh, are younger by age but all of us are young by attitude i believe and uh, so this is a young arbitrators uh, discussion uh, because we are talking about the future and so so we will be hearing a lot from young arbitrators and the uh, uh, and then, of course, uh, uh, those of us who have been young for, for longer uh, will uh, pitch in with, uh, with, with our comments uh, as well. So, very welcome. Uh, really very, very happy to see you all. And I would like now to ask to say a few words um, uh, for, uh, as a start of, of, to open the event. Uh, my two very dear colleagues, um, uh, Emmanuel Gaillard, uh, professor and uh, really distinguished writer and distinguished uh, theoretician of international arbitration and, and of course, uh, very, very successful practitioner. Emmanuel, as we all know, is uh, the global head of uh, disputes at uh, Sherman and Sterling Paris. And he is uh, uh, one of the founders of um, the International Arbitration um, Academy. And he was the first president of the academy. So uh, then after Emmanuel, so that I, I, will, I will introduce both of our keynote uh, honorary speakers, because uh, then I will, won't have to intervene and we'll save time. Uh, after Emmanuel, um, uh, Yas Panifetemi has kindly agreed to say a few words. Yas is the head of uh, public international law at Sherman and Sterling in Paris. Uh, Yas is very distinguished arbitrator and, and uh, very distinguished pr practitioner with uh, very big experience and, and very creative mind, a creative legal mind. And Yas uh, is the first secretary general of the International Arbitration Academy. So, Emmanuel, Yas, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Vilius. First, I want to say how delighted I am to participate in this venture. Thank you to TGS for having uh, got the idea and discussed this and invited us. And, uh, and thank you also to all of the uh, International Academy members. Everybody but you, Vilius, is an alumni or a former professor at the Academy. So next year you will have to participate as a professor, I guess, uh, given your, your standing. And, uh, and I'm, I'm truly delighted. And I will just say a few words by way of introduction, just to ask questions. I think the questions we are going to be facing uh, due to the COVID crisis uh, can be viewed in three different times. 
And I think since this is a prospective um, a seminar, I think we should focus on all of these times. The first is the current, the current situation. Uh, how are we going to have hearings? Do we want to postpone them? Initially, uh, parties and arbitrators started to postpone and then the fall was full and then the early next year is full and now arbitrators are pushing to have them remote. Is it possible? Is it suited for complex cases or for simple cases? What kind of, uh, how do you do a cross-examination, presentation, the technicalities and all that? That's the first series of questions. Then the second time I think will be in the coming months when people will be able to travel, but not so much internationally, they may be able to travel uh, domestically. And then the next wave of questions will be, can you organize uh, partially live, partially remote arbitration? Like you may have um, a, a group of people in Paris in a single room, respecting certain, certain rules, uh, the rest of the crowd in DC and others in London. I mean, it's partially live, partially remote, and I think we have to face that. Is it useful or is it better to be entirely remote so that equality of the parties is respected? At the same time, if you can have the witness and a few uh, participants in the same room, that may be useful. That's the second phase. And the third one, which is equally important, uh, I think, is what happens after the crisis. Um, it's, it's human nature will, will be there and human nature is you just forget what, what happened and, and go back, back to your bad or good habits and forget everything and, and resume uh, business as usual. Uh, so that will be at play, of course. But at the same time, I think that the crisis will be so profound and, and so important uh, in terms of changing habits for a sufficiently long time that it will have a, a long lasting impact. And I think in two ways. First, people will get used to have uh, some, of the, um, some of the hearing, at least some, at least the opening, certainly the procedural hearings, some of it remote. And frankly, if you think in today's terms, it was completely ridiculous to have 30 people rushing to Washington, sitting in the basement of the World Bank for half a day, just to discuss them, you know, the, the next procedural steps and coming from Latin America, from, from all over the world. That's ridiculous. And frankly, I hope that we are going to dispense with that going forward, knowing that we already had some remote hearings, we already had some, some certainly procedural hearings, terms of reference in the ICC remote, but I think we have more of that. I, as a chair of an arbitral tribunal, I already had some of the witnesses heard remotely when I heard that they would come, they had a two-page te testimony, and they would come from, from the Middle East for, to testify for 15 minutes just to, to certify that something happened. And I imposed a remote uh, hearing in, in, uh, in that uh, case for the, for the limited purpose, pre-COVID, for the limited purpose of hearing two people who had very, very little to say. I had to twist arms and the parties were reluctant, but uh, maybe we saved 30K or something yeah, just, just on these two witnesses who spoke actually for, for 20 minutes altogether. So that I hope we do more of and we realize that we, ha we have to, a duty to, to be more efficient. Now, also, I think it will have a, 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 an important uh, impact, indirect impact not just because we realize that we can do things remotely, and not everything necessarily, the, 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 the big question would be the difficult long cross-examination and can you have a long hearing with people in different places, that's a challenge um, when it's a long hearing and all that, but certain things we can do remotely. So that's one aspect. The other aspect is that the businesses will be more cost sensitive than ever because the, the economic crisis will be lasting longer than the COVID uh, crisis. 
And I, I can predict that the, uh, there is al al already a lot of tension on arbitration. It's too expensive, it's too complicated. I thought it was simpler and easier than the courts, but it's not. Uh, and, and that criticism of arbitration has been uh, voiced for a, a few decades now and nothing happens. But I think the, the clients, the parties, will be cost conscious and say, they will say, why are you all going to Washington? Why are you congregating in a hotel for a week from different parts of the world? Can you do at least some of it remote, uh, remotely? So I think the pressure will come from the habit we may have uh, contracted uh, during this crisis, but also from the pressure from the clients to be more effective. And is there something to learn from what we are doing now which we could, we could continue to do in, in good times, in healthy times. So these are the questions I have for the short term, for the mid term, and for the long term. Thank you. Yes. Hello, everyone. Um, I hope that this finds everyone in, health, in health, great health and safety. And thank you for coming and attending this, um, this important event. My thanks go to Vilius, um, Tada, Senegle for having organized this important event, uh, TGS generally, and of course the Arbitration Academy alumni. It's, a, it's an institution that I have deep in my heart. Um, it took a lot of effort to, to come bring it to life. It has been a great success ever since we created it in 2011. I also want to pay tribute to the current team led by Professor Daniel Cohen, who's the current chair and the current president of the academy, and really encourage those who are listening to look up the program and attend the academy, which is which brings really the best and the brightest um, to, to, to learn from, from everyone and each other. I will not go into substance at this point. I really want to leave it to Tyra Senegle to, to take us through their ideas and how they see this. I do want though to say that in my view, this is going to shake and change things, not only legally, but also technologically. And, and we see how technology will work and is already working, but also sociologically and culturally. I think that these are all of the aspects that we need to, to tackle if we're going to discuss all these questions through the agenda that you have already. So I will stop here for now and I will pick it up with great pleasure following. Um, your, your presentation status in England and Fabiana and Anatia, of course. Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. Thank you, Yas. Um, now I would like to introduce our moderator. Agler uh, is uh, an associate with DJS uh, Baltic. We are really, uh, really proud of you, Agler, for initiating this and for, and for moderating. Uh, I am proud of you in advance. And Dagley has been is an alumni of uh, the, um, the International Arbitration Academy, and is also a very very uh, fast learning and, and promising uh, young associate uh, working on really complicated cases already very successfully. So, Agley, please now uh, this whole discussion and the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much, Phyllis. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to thank you for joining us. I am Agla Masita and I will be moderating this webinar. Uh, first, I would also like to thank Velus, Yas and Emmanuel for their introduction. All of you will hear from them during our second part of this webinar, the discussion and Q&A session. From the very beginning, COVID-19 pandemic has been changing lives and it is challenging time for all of us. I hope that all of you are healthy and safe. Arbitration is flexible and it makes the arbitration an attractive dispute resolution tool. However, the outbreak of COVID-19 is affecting it in various ways. Many questions and issues arise today in respect of international disputes. And it is very difficult to predict how the future will look like. During the webinar, it will be discussed what challenges and opportunities COVID-19 brings to international arbitration. Can it progress effectively by using virtual technology? What's next for arbitration institutions and many more? 
it is my pleasure to introduce an order of today's webinar. An event is composed of two parts. First, we will have presentations on two different topics. First one is virtual hearings. Are the new normal? What technical aspects should be taken into consideration? What issues related to witness cross-examination they bring? And the second topic is different approach from arbitration institutions, as well as how should they prepare for the future? Presentations will be given by three speakers, which are Tadas, he is a senior associate at TGS Baltic Lithuania, Fabiana, she is a senior associate at Eleonora Coelho Advocados Brazil, and Anindia, he is a senior associate at Kaitan & Co from India. The second part of today's webinar is a discussion and Q&A session. The discussion will take place not only on the issues that was discussed in the first part of our webinar, but also on any other matter that is directly related to the topic of today's webinar. During this event, you can ask questions by using chat option, which is on the right side of your screen. Moreover, six people will participate in the discussion. Three of them I have already introduced, and others are, well, I'm sure an introduction is not even needed, leading professionals, professors, Yasban Fatemi and Emmanuel Gayat, and of course, Velus Bernatonis, managing partner at TGS Baltic. Velus is also the head of Baltic chapter of CR. Without further delay, I would like to give the floor to our first speaker, Tadas, and he will share his insights on whether virtual, techno virtual hearings are new normal or only a temporary tool in a time of a crisis. Hello, everyone. I hope you see and hear me well. Uh, first of all, let me express my gratitude to all our listeners and viewers for finding time either early in the morning or during the noon or in the evening after working hours, finding time to attend this webinar. I hope that uh, the issues and the problems we are going to discuss today will be interesting and useful and give you some thoughts on the future of arbitration. Uh, I also, taking this opportunity, would like to encourage you to use this possibility to ask questions. We have really prominent speakers today who provided their introductions. So use this opportunity to ask them uh, the questions you would like to hear answers, the questions that concern you. So now moving on to the first topic of today's webinar, that being virtual hearings, uh, I would like to start with uh, International Arbitration Survey conducted by Queen Mary University and White and Case. In this international arbitration survey conducted in 2018, the respondents were asked, should virtual hearing rooms be used more often in arbitration? And 66% of the respondents said, yes, virtual hearing rooms should be used more often in arbitration. However, 64% of the respondents said that they never use virtual hearing rooms and 14% said that they rarely use virtual hearing rooms. So in total, 78%, if I'm correct, of the respondents never or rarely use virtual hearing rooms and that was the reality in 2018. So in other words, before 2020, virtual hearing, hearings were something that looked more like a distant future, something that might happen in the future, but that future being not today and not tomorrow. Now, what happened? I read somewhere that need or necessity is the engine of innovation. 
And COVID-19 is no exception and the best proof what the need can do to our lives. Uh, there is no doubt that coronavirus changed our lives. Even more, our lives were changed within days or weeks and unexpectedly. For example, how many of you imagine working from home offices every day when you were celebrating the new year? I guess probably none of you believe that that might happen. And now it's the new reality. We are almost all working from our home offices. And some of us even probably forgot how our, how our real offices look like. So COVID-19 brought us the innovation of virtual hearings against our own will. And what looked like a distant future in 2018 become ine became inevitable in 2020. Therefore, it is absolutely normal that having to face this new reality that came to us so fast, so unexpectedly, we have more questions than answers. Professor Gayard, or Gayard or already raised those questions, and this is also the reason why this webinar is being organized and many other webinars by different arbitration institutions in different parts of the world, law firms organize webinars to try to answer these questions. These webinars are organized exactly because we do not know the answers. We do not know how the future looks like, but that doesn't mean that we should not prepare for that future, that we should not discuss how it will look like. So this arbitration will try to give you some guidance. And speaking about virtual hearings, one of the questions that I would like to raise today for our discussion is, is there a room for Article 5.1b of the New York Convention in respect of virtual hearings? Article 5.1b of the Convention provides that recognition of an award may be refused if party was unable to present his case. The New York Convention, of course, does not elaborate on what inability to present one's case means, leaving room for interpretation, allowing courts to elaborate more, national courts to, to explain this provision, to interpret this. Now, imagine a situation. Imagine that we have a party in arbitration, let's say respondent, who does not agree to have a virtual hearing for whatever reason. But the tribunal decides not to delay the proceedings and organizes virtual hearing. What if this respondent in this situation is located in a country where internet is much slower than the country of the residence of the claimant? What if the claimant is from California, for example, the tribunal is also from California and the respondent is located in Australia. And the tribunal decides to organize the hearing under California time. Furthermore, uh, quarantine regimes differ in different countries. What if our respondent and its counsel cannot be in one room together as in the example Emmanuel provided us, while the claimant and its counsel are participating in the hearing, being at the, in the same room at the same time. It's, of course, issues of principle of equality. Is it violated in this situation? But, of course, it leaves room for interpretation. Is Article 5.1b of the New York Convention infringed if the parties have different opportunities to present their case and one of the parties is unable to present its case in the same way as the other party is allowed. Another issue is, are virtual hearings suitable for any arbitration case? Again, imagine two cases. One is a simple contractual dispute with no or very few witnesses and the case file of a normal extent, and another case, let's say, a construction dispute. 
a construction dispute with thousands of exhibits, tens of witnesses and experts. Should we consider these two cases equal in terms of virtual hearing? When we were organizing this webinar, we were advised to talk briefly. That's of course something I do not do now. Because why we were advised to talk briefly? Because it is more difficult for those listening to concentrate when someone is talking too long. It's too difficult to watch someone on the other side of the screen talking for hours. And from my personal perspective, it is absolutely true. Last week I had an event, a virtual event, which lasted more than four hours. And to be honest, it was already difficult to listen to what people were saying already after the first hours. Now imagine, imagine the tribunal sitting at their homes, at their home offices all day or even weeks as some hearings last, listening to counsel's opening statements, cross-examinations, etc., uh, rephrasing the popular pop song, arbitrators are only humans. We cannot expect them to manage to listen to what parties and their councils are saying for hours, days, or weeks. That's simply impossible, humanly impossible. So in my opinion, virtual hearings currently under the technologies we have now are not suitable for any case. We cannot say that the simple contractual, dis contractual dispute is equal to difficult construction dispute. No, they are different and we cannot say that every dispute is ready for virtual hearing or at least virtual hearing of complicated cases should be organized differently. For example, uh, parties could provide their openings and closings in writing, but today I do not see how that could be possible if we have a very complex case where a lot of is at stake. So to sum up, answering the question you see on the slide, is virtual hearing a new normal or only a temporary tool today? My answer, answer would be neither. Virtual hearings may become a new reality for some cases, particularly taking into account that virtual hearings allow to save costs. It's also good for climate change, which we forgot because of COVID-19 a little bit. However, I do not see virtual hearings uh, becoming an only way of organizing hearings in the nearest future. That's my opinion, and it will be interesting to hear the thoughts of our other speakers. What do they think about virtual hearings? Thank you very much. Thank you, Tadas. Now I would like to invite Fabiana and she will be speaking about technical issues uh, of virtual hearings and also share some recommendations how to conduct and proceed with virtual hearings. Well, thank you, Agli. Hello, everyone. Um, first, I would like to thank again TGS Baltic for the kind invitation to speak here today. And I would like to greet our speakers, Mr. Villiers, Professor Gaillard, Professor Benefatemi, Anindia, Tadas, and Egli, and our participants in this webinar. Well, among very difficult questions to answer uh, that Tadas just mentioned, um, if virtual hearings uh, are suitable for arbitration cases, for example, of course, that uh, case by case will have to be analyzed by the ARPTA tribunal. But in case it is possible, my address topic here today is regarding technical issues in remote hearings. And well, I don't know if how you took it, but at first I did not believe or did not want to believe that quarantine would take long. And probably so did the parties in ARPTA proceedings. Uh, at least in our practice here, we saw that the first reaction of parties was to postpone uh, the evidentiary hearings that were scheduled to take place during the beginning of social isolation. However, this has started to take longer than we imagined and the hearings are starting to take place again in order to save time and keep the business and the proceedings running. But now they're virtual. 
So um, as we did not have much experience with this kind of hearings, as Stadas mentioned, some institutions set very useful guidelines to help us get prepared to this new reality. I bring here 10 tips. There are many more, of course, but we don't have much time. And so these rules should be followed before the hearing in order to avoid some technical problems during the virtual hearings. And most of all, to allow that both parties have equal treatment and possibilities to present their cases. I took them from CR guidance note on remote dispute resolution proceedings, CPR's annotated model procedure order for remote video arbitration proceedings, and ICC guidance note on possible measures aimed at mitigating the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. All of them may be easily accessed in the internet. So, Uh, one, first of all, it is important to have an agreement on an online video and audio conferencing platform that preferably offers access to shared documentation like we have here today and allows the creation of breakout rooms. These breakout rooms are used for deliberations and private discussions between only some of the participants in the hearing. And most importantly, of course, it is necessary that the platform is compatible with participants' equipment. Two, testing previously all software, telephone and internet connections, as well as audiovisual quality by a technical support person, by the arbitral institution or whoever was appointed responsible for these issues. Three, make sure that all participants are familiar with the technologies used, and if not, offer tutorials regarding it. Four, setting an order of appearance and timeline, pointing out the specific needs of witnesses and for translation where necessary as agreed by the parties in order not to have surprises during the hearing or to realize the need to postpone it after all. Five, it is recommended to allocate sufficient time frames between all steps of the hearing to eliminate possible connection or other technical failures once a meeting or hearing has begun. Six, running a mock session with all participants beforehand to ensure everything is in order, as some of us did here at least three times, for example, before this webinar today. Seven, appointing a person who will be responsible to manage the meeting. For example, are the meeting and excluding participants in accordance to a previous list of, of participants, moving participants to breakout rooms, muting microphones, etc. This may, may save time. Eight, distributing electronic bundles beforehand may facilitate the access to documents. In this regard, there are a few platforms that offer this service. IBA has a guide on technology resources for arbitration practitioners that lists some of these products and may be very useful. Make nine, make an agreement on a backup plan. This is very important. So for example, sending a previous call in information for teleconference if the connection, connection is lost or having a specific contact to receive emergency communications regarding loss of connection and to inform this to other participants. And 10, it is recommended that virtual technical support is available beforehand to all participants during the virtual hearing. So besides these tips from the guidelines, I would give an 11th tip, but that is fully my opinion. And this is an attempt to help answering Tada's question regarding the New York Convention. Uh, so, I would suggest that by the end of virtual hearings, arbitrators may state that they could fully understand both parties' presentation of the case, independently of disparity of equipment and connection, if that's true, of course. <laughs> and at last, I would like to comment that even though there is some resistance and downsides regarding virtual hearings, such as more probability to have technical issues, disparity of equipment and connection between the parties, or that it may be different to evaluate if a witness is truly being honest or not. In Brazil, it was publicized that when social isolation took place, a hearing that involved more than 70 people from different parts of the world was being held. The Arbitral Tribunal and the parties agreed to transform it in a virtual hearing 
in the middle of the whole process. Uh, it was reported that all happened very smoothly. The arbitrators were very happy, the parties as well. And this proves that even big virtual hearings are possible and they be, may be very useful. Of course, that um, after social isolation, um, it is, uh, it is the, the use of virtual hearings will depend on case by case. But now we know that it can be part of the evolution of arbitration, mainly because it saves time in terms of necessary travels, for example. And I, when I talk about Brazil, I have to tackle the problem of traffic jam. And this saves, um, saving this time also means that probably the arbitrator and lawyers may have more time to study the case and get prepared for the hearings. And of course, it saves costs with the hearing structure itself and with travel costs for arbitrators, witnesses, etc. So, these are my comments for this topic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fabiana. Now I would like to give the floor to Anindia and he will present uh, issues on witness cross-examination. Thank you, Ekle. And I'd uh, like this opportunity to thank Willis, uh, Taras, and Ekle, and Teachers Politic for introducing, uh, for inviting me for this uh, webinar. And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all the people watching in, depending on what part of the world you are logging in from. Uh, as Taras mentioned, and this is something that I agree with, virtual hearings are not a universal solution. It's not a one-size-fits-all you know, kind of solution. Uh, virtual hearings may be suited for some hearings compared to the other ones. And uh, thanks to the common law approach, common law influence, cross-examination is an intrinsic and a very critical part of the arbitration hearing process. Uh, and uh, I feel that virtual hearings and cross-examinations bring some issues some of which I hope to cover during today's presentation. Uh, some of the main concerns that I have seen is that uh, the question of, is the witness being coached? Is he being assisted? Is there anyone in the room that you cannot see that's helping him out? Is the witness relying on some documents that, uh, that you, that's not been shared with you, that has not been shared with the tribunal? Apart from this, which are major concerns, and this is something that I've been hearing a lot in webinars dealing with virtual hearings. Some of the other issue is uh, when you're cross-examining a witness, it is very important for you to pick up on non-verbal cues, or what you call body language. And it's not only the witness whose body language is important. In most cases, it's also the tribunal's body language that is important. Especially if you are doing something risky, like you know, questioning the credibility of a witness, you want to be very certain that the tribunal is not you know, getting annoyed by it and the tribunal is on the same page as you are. So I feel that if, especially when you don't have HD quality video or if there's a lag in the video, non-verbal you know, non cues or body language cues can be misplaced, can be lost, and this is a bit of a concern. Apart from general concerns, speaking from the Indian perspective, there are other concerns as well. One thing we have to keep in mind, one who has any experience will, with Indian arbitrations will know, Cross-examination is a very lengthy process. It's very different from what people in Europe and Singapore and Hong Kong are used to. A lot many questions are asked. Uh, and therefore for this, you need everyone to be really comfortable with the technology, which brings me to the second problem. Adoption of technology in India so far has been very low. There is a mindset issue more than a tech, uh, an infrastructure issue. Because if COVID-19 has shown us something is that infrastructure tech infrastructure, you know, your, your, your broadband, your internet is not as bad as we thought it was before. And another good thing of COVID-19 is that it has forced people to actually use, start using technology more than they were using it before. Therefore, I feel that as a result of COVID-19 and the post-pandemic era, clients, arbitrators, and practitioners will be more open to using virtual hearings. But I still question if they will be open to hearing, open to virtual hearings for cross-examinations or maybe for other types, other stages, such as your procedural hearing or oral submissions where either cost is an issue or the arbitration is not so complex. The issues are not so complex. There are solutions already available, some of which Fabiana mentioned before. There are a lot of protocols and guidance notes. A lot of you may have heard of uh, the SOL protocol and there are the Delos checklist, which also deals with how cross-examination is to be prepared for, especially uh, if it's a virtual hearing. Uh, I 
invite all of you to please look up look these up especially the soul protocol the delos checklist and for what fabiana mentioned the cir guidelines and the icc guidance look these are very very helpful resources if you are preparing for a virtual hearing especially where you, if you can't avoid cross examination and you have to have it on a virtual hearing uh in terms of regional level that is the asia level hkic kcab and the ciac are really encouraging parties to use use virtual hearings this is something i will get into more in my second presentation apart from policy level solutions there are also tech level solutions uh it could be expensive technology or it could be relatively cheaper technology if you're looking at if you have the cost bandwidth there are also providers like epic and opus they provide not only software but also hardware solutions so this is something that can be explored if cost is not too much of a concern and also apart from cost of course there is also the issue of the witness not being able to travel maybe a pandemic issue or maybe a health issue or several issues why the witness is not being able to travel so apart from waiting to reach a point in time where the witness can travel i think it's better to spend money on these softwares and expedite the process if cost is an issue there are other solutions such as the what are called out cameras or 360 degree cameras that can be controlled by the tribunal and you can look around and see who's there in the room apart from the the witness you can also have a multiple camera system instead of a single 360 degree camera i believe the best way is to use both of these uh, policy level and the tech level solutions together but there are also low tech or practical solutions This is something that was done in in an arbitration that uh, that my firm is dealing with. So we actually had representatives from both parties sit in the same room as the as the witness has been cross examined. That way you know what the witness is looking at, and there is a bit more comfort in what's happening uh, without spending too much on technology. Therefore, to conclude, we do have policy level and tech level solutions. But going back to what Taras mentioned. Virtual hearings are not a panacea. They may be better suited for uh, procedural hearings, oral submissions, or in some cases also for cross-examination where cost is an issue or the witness is not able to travel, and you need to expedite the process. That's my time. Then I hand over the the, the, the floor to Eklay. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Anindya, very much. Um, we all can see that there are there are a lot of issues related to virtual hearings. Talking from my own experience, uh, just a couple of hours ago, the electricity in the whole neighborhood was shut down, meaning that I could not charge my laptop and I did not have no internet. so it is big it is crucial to be prepared for all, all of these issues however in my personal opinion i believe that uh, virtual hearings is an opportunity for international arbitration and it can be a more effective way to solve a dispute without any delay and of course um, reduce some costs now i would like to invite tadas uh, once again to talk about arbitration institutions and how should they prepare for the future thank you agle uh, i i see we already have some questions i encourage others also to to ask questions do not hesitate use this opportunity and and uh, this is our uh, second topic in this discussion before moving to discussion so you have lots of time to 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 raise the questions that concern you so that other topic as agles said is arbitration institutions and the question is should they adapt to the new normal and how to adapt uh, how to adapt to the to the new reality uh, talking about the future of post covid 19 arbitration i believe it is inevitable to talk about arbitration institutions and uh, we have so many of them uh, worldwide smaller or larger and they are competing between each other to attract more businesses to win more cases and i believe now our arbitration institutions may add one new point to this competition that point being 
how to prepare to that, that post-COVID-19 future, because those institutions who prepare, who will prepare better, will have, I believe, a better standing between between businesses when they choose what arbitration institution should administer their disputes. And also, I believe this is a very good opportunity for small arbitration institutions to increase their popularity. Now, few points how to do that. You already see them on the screen. And the first one I would like to, I would like to raise is online case management systems. Uh, from what we see now, uh, some of arbitration institutions have already introduced these systems and submission of procedural documents, communication between the tribunal and the parties is now possible online. This is the case, for example, in Vienna International Arbitration Center or London Court of International Arbitration. And here yeah, I'm very proud that I may also praise the only arbitration institution we have here in Lithuania, Vilnius Court of Commercial Arbitration, which introduced its case management system called Arbis already a few years ago. And to my knowledge, most of arbitrations that were started before the Vilnius Court of Commercial Arbitration are conducted via this system. So when the COVID-19 pandemic started, Vilnius Court of Commercial Arbitration could provide services as usual. And I believe other arbitration institutions, despite their size, smaller or larger, should take this example, should take action and start creating these uh, case management systems. Uh, otherwise, it might be difficult to catch up if you start too late. Uh, for example, I read an article today on Arbitration Italia website that after the pandemic started, Milan Arbitration Chamber stayed the terms for filling any submission in its arbitration proceedings and the terms for the issuance of arbitral awards. Correct me if I'm wrong, but Milan Arbitration Chamber does not have a case management system. So let me ask this. If you were Nostradam and you somehow knew that quarantine regime will be introduced in 2020, would you have advised your client to choose Milan Arbitration Chamber or, for example, Vienna International Arbitration Center? This is of course, an open question, but it becomes a very important question when we are looking to the future. Second question, second issue, should arbitration institutions revise their arbitration rules and recommended arbitration clauses? As discussed before, virtual hearings might create some difficulties that potentially may lead to the annulment or non-recognition of arbitral award. So arbitration institutions should not consider that re revising arbitration uh, rules or recommended clauses is something not necessary because we might have a big problem in the future and we must prepare for, for, this, for this future. And for example, it is, uh, it, is, it will be interesting to hear uh, during the discussion, would it be advisable for arbitration institutions to amend their arbitration rules and, for example, explicitly allow virtual hearings, setting some ground rules, etc. The same with recommended arbitration clauses. Uh, maybe it should be useful to include into the clause that parties agree to have their dispute resolved via virtual hearing if the arbitral tribunal so decides. Finally, guidelines. As Fabiana already mentioned, uh, ICC uh, provided its guidelines uh, in the beginning of April. In my opinion, other arbitration institutions should follow this example. 
because we live in we live in an age of technology and technology is changing very fast sometimes even too fast so it might be really difficult sometimes to adopt so some guidelines as to how should hearings be organized or uh, setting some ground rules some etiquette rules would be would be very useful so the example of icc could be followed by other arbitration institutions as well to sum up i believe you already understood my opinion uh, that i have uh, when analyzing this question i believe arbitration institutions being if i may say so faces of international arbitration cannot just wait and see they must take action of course it doesn't mean that institutions have to drop everything and when this webinar is over go immediately amend their arbitration rules and clauses uh, no that's of course not something that should be done very immediately but i believe it should not be left for some distant future arbitration institutions must be prepared uh, be why because because arbitration institutions are service providers. You may have different understanding of who arbitrators are. Are they service providers? Are they uh, some kind of judges? Arbitration institutions are service provider, providers. And if the quality of the service does not meet the expectations of the client, then such service providers have no other option but to eventually extinct. So I wish and I hope that arbitration institutions will not become dinosaurs of international arbitration, but rather be the motivators of the change. Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to hear the thoughts of our panelists during the discussion. Thank you, Tadas. I definitely agree. And I'm also really looking forward to hearing some more thoughts on this topic. And now I would like to invite Fabiana uh, once again, and she will be speaking about Brazil's perspective. So the floor is yours. Thank you again, Egli. So as you already mentioned, I will talk about the Brazil's perspective on ARP2 institutions and the COVID-19. So just for background, um, according to a survey in 2018, eight of the most renowned Brazilian arbitral institutions were administering 902 arbitration proceedings. Almost half of, the, half of this number is run by the Center for Arbitration and Mediation of the Brazil Canada Chamber of Commerce, known as CAMTA CVC, and the other half divided between the other seven institutions. Also, Brazil is ranked in third place among countries with most parties represented in ICC cases. There were 133 cases in 2019, staying behind USA and France only. So as you may see in Brazil, most arbitration proceedings are, are administered by arbitral institutions and our arbitral market is quite relevant, especially for domestic arbitrations. And from numbers and statistics in last years, arbitration is becoming more and more common to solve commercial disputes. I would say that this is because in one side, our courts have a great amount of cases to decide. Judges don't usually have the time, availability, and specialty necessary to analyze the merits in dispute. And also a judicial case usually takes longer to get decided than an arbitral case. But in another, in another side, and this is the most important reason for arbitration to be chosen here in Brazil, courts, especially our Superior Court of Justice, are very arbitration friendly. So in view of this scenario, a natural effect of the pandemic, and as I believe happened in most parts of the world, and so did in Lithuania, these arbitral institutions had to adapt very fast in order to keep the proceedings running normally. They took about only one or two days after the social isolation to adopt measures and set rules to allow fully online proceedings. Hard copies filing have been seized or postponed and they are all offering alternatives for the parties and the arbitral tribunal to hold, on, to hold online hearings. 
Some of them are even offering programs to get safe digital signatures in terms of references or awards, for example. I spoke informally to five renowned Brazilian arbitration institutions in the last days. And with exception of only one institution that already had most of its proceedings being run online and did not feel uh, much of the impacts of the pandemic, all the other ones had to adapt to, to the new reality. The case managers are having to quick, le quick learn uh, about the technologies and all the features that are offered. And of course, this takes some time, but they reported that there are no big delays in the proceedings. And now actually they are facing less bureaucracy and the day-by-day -day work in general has become simpler and more efficient. This, uh, this also follows a reduction of, co of costs, of course, and not only with infrastructure, but also with paper, envelopes, posts, etc. For example, at Comsa CBC, in a brief calculation, they are saving the use of almost 4,000 envelopes during this period, what is great for the environment. And they also said that almost no proceedings were put on hold because of the pandemic and there were no drop downs because of it, thank God. And in most institutions, arbitration proceedings are being commenced normally. They have either registered the same amount of proceedings or even had a slight increase compared to the same time in past years. None of these uh, new commenced uh, proceedings were related to the effects of COVID-19 so far, just for curiosity. And uh, some also report uh, that they have been asked more often for information regarding mediation, what is a very interesting data. Another interesting information is that even though it is too soon to have concrete data and statistics, all of them reported that there is a, at least a feeling that arbitration proceedings are being run in a most efficient way by the Arbitral Tribunal. This means that the new online reality may save time and may truly reflect in a more effective case management, even though it is still too soon to affirm it, I repeat. And finally, I would like to comment on Tada's question regarding the actions of arbitration institutions in times like this. I bring here the words of Honorable Chief Justice of Singapore, Sandaresh Menon, in his speech at the SIAC Congress of 2018, in which he stated that arbitral institutions have not only a special role, but a duty to shape the future of arbitration. At that time, it was impossible to know that a virus could change the way that arbitral proceedings would be run. But I believe that Mr. Menon's words are mostly applied right now, and our two institutions do have a main role during this pandemic. That is because, one, they must adopt rules to keep the game playing, as they have, most of them, at least here in Brazil. Two, their rules and resolutions must be transparent, and this brings safety to the parties to adopt them, and the various institutions may learn with the experiences of one another. And three, if they act promptly, Helping parties and arbitrators to solve problems that may appear during this, the proceedings and also helping the parties and lawyers regarding uh, their challenges on presenting their cases, they may, be their, uh, they may be the big responsible for the possible revolution that arbitration will face or is already facing. Thank you. Thank you, Fabiana, for your insights. Last but not least, an India, and he will share Indian and regional perspective on this question. Thank you, Ekli. Uh, so the last topic, uh, and the second one that I'm going to speak on is on, of course, as Ekli mentioned, the Indian and regional perspectives and what role institution arbitration can play in the face of COVID-19. As I mentioned earlier, the Indian arbitration scenario is very different from what you may be used to in other parts of the world. And if there's one uncontroversial thing that you can mention about Indian arbitration is that ad hoc is much more preferred than institutional arbitration. Uh, personally, I have seen maybe one or two institutional arbitrations where both parties were Indian and it was seated in India. Uh, because the institutional use is low, there are some different challenges that institutions have here. They have to build from the foundation up. It's not just a question of, you know, 
adapting to the pandemic situation. To give you an example, uh, one of the most prominent institutional arbitrations, institutional uh, arbitration institutions in India, it's called the Mumbai Center for in International Arbitration. This was set up in 2016. So in terms of institutional age, that's very young, only four years old. And in those four years, it has administered about eight cases. But uh, in what we also see is that more clients are putting institutional arbitration in their contracts, including the MCIA and the state of Maharashtra, where I'm from, where Mumbai is, has uh, put in a policy where the government contracts of more than $900,000, you have to go to the MCIA for arbitration. So we hope to see more institutional arbitrations coming up in the future. But of course, that doesn't stop the problem that they still have to build from the foundation up, as I mentioned earlier. That being said, I think this is a good opportunity for Indian institution arbitrations less to, to encourage the case of virtual hearings because due to the pandemic, as I mentioned in the first session, more people have started using technology. There is lesser inertia right now to use technology. So I think the Indian institution should, uh, should, should capitalize on this position that we're in right now and uh, make virtual hearings to encourage virtual hearings, especially for procedural hearings or where the value or the complexity of the dispute is not so much. Now, what I spoke of mostly is where the, both parties are Indian and where the arbitration is also seated in India. What happens if it's an international commercial arbitration? Whether, yes, institutional arbitration is being used more there. To give you some examples and statistics, as per the CIAC 2019 report, India was the highest user of, uh, of its services outside of Singaporean parties. And even with the HKIC 2018 report, India uses substantial, Indian parties were substantial users of, those, of their services. This neatly brings me to the regional perspective that I have, regional meaning the Asia perspective. Compared to India, of course, institutional arbitrations are adopted much more. Uh, what we've also seen is that requests for adjournments are lesser than when it comes to ad hoc Indian, uh, Indian arbitrations. Naturally, more people are using virtual hearing given the pandemic situation. Uh, in fact, even the institutions such as HKIC, SIAC, and KCAP are encouraging uh, people to use virtual hearings. SIAC is encouraging people to use the Maxwell Chambers service that's there. It's a very good service. And HKIC is asking people to use third party services, maybe Zoom or what we're using today, or you know, WebEx or uh, Microsoft Teams and the several other service providers that are there. What's also interesting to note, uh, I, had this, I had a chance to go through the HKIC press release that came out just last week. It said that 85% of requests in the last two months that they got were for cases which they want virtual hearings or will, they will need virtual hearings going in the future. So of course, the moment is right to capitalize and to encourage virtual hearings, especially as I mentioned earlier, for procedural hearings and where the issue or the complexity or the costs involved are lesser. Therefore, to conclude, in India, institutions have to build from the foundation up. That does not mean they don't encourage parties to use virtual hearings. And as a regional perspective, They've already started encouraging people are responding, more parties are using virtual hearing, and I think that needs to continue. And to end, I would like to leave you with a thought, another question, more to practitioners than to institutions. We have learned a lot about technology. We have adopted a lot of technology. Going forward, after normal life resumes, are we going to go back to our old ways, or are we going to adapt and use more technology and be more efficient and help the client save some costs? With that, back to you, Egli. Thank you. And India, um, we all can see that uh, uh, there are a lot of questions uh, and I would like to thank for all the listeners and I hope that you enjoyed the first part of our webinar. And I would like to start with a question to Professor Emmanuel Gaillard. Uh, how will the COVID-19 impact international arbitration generally? We have already discussed some changes uh, to the way we do arbitration. However, do you believe that in future majority of cases will be conducted virtually? 
The majority of cases, maybe if we are talking about smaller arbitrations, I really welcome, I would really dream of a world in which we would uh, do uh, smaller arbitrations, the two-day hearing, uh, opening, and a couple of witnesses. That I would very much like to see remote and do do done virtually because I'm very concerned with the costs. Uh, the cost of arbitration have uh, gone out of hand, and uh, and and the, the clients complain about that. The arbitration community is completely deaf about that. They say yes, 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 but we do it for a good reason. We need the opening. We need the PHPs. We need the the the, the hearings. Uh, I need to see people. I need to bring everybody to the same place. And it's not true. It's a trade-off. It's better, maybe, but the cost is enormous, and 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 we have to be all very mindful of that. So yes, I would hope that a large number of cases is conducted remotely, which, by the way, would make the seat an uh, antique uh, concept. But um, but that 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 is something I I look forward to. to. Now the, the the one thing which has been which has not been touched upon in the discussion and which, which may be something we see in the future is split hearings. Uh, because we all have taken habits, the habit of spending three weeks a month uh, somewhere all together in the same place comes from the difficulty to have a number of hearings and reconvene everybody if you do it by smaller bites. At the beginning of my career, I, as a, one of my first cases as arbitrator, I was a co-arbitrator. We were uh, sitting in Switzerland in a very large construction case, and we we took uh, we took a, a series of claims. It's 50 or, or, or so claims, you know, in a FIDI case, typical construction case, and we we sat three days per month. Uh, every every month and taking the soil claims the, the whatever delays claims or whatever by, by categories of claims and and that is something which we can do remotely now if we are going to I think a, a, color, a corollary of doing things remotely uh, is going to be uh, split hearings for larger cases because as we all said it's uh, difficult to sit for you know, to listen for it's hard enough to listen for two three days uh, remotely when people are in different places or hours uh, but if you do it two days here two days there two days there it may be more um, uh, digestible so i think that will be an impact also uh, but i will leave it there because i don't want to monopolize the the discussion so these are my initial two remarks Okay, thank you very much. Um, I can see that we have a question related to what extent do arbitral tribunals have power to order online hearings absent party consent? And maybe um, Yas would like to share her thoughts on this topic. Thank you, Ekle. Um if I may, I will I will answer this very specific. I had picked it up actually. There, there there's a couple of questions on, on tribunal powers, and I, I I do want to address that. If I may, just just um, give a few general comments on on the discussion so far. Um, I think it's important to keep in mind that the different angles, um, uh, because of the different people and different functions, right? An institution will not approach the issue the same way as a tribunal or a party or council, because the interest of every person is different, right? So TADAS show that institutions are service providers. They, there is a big competition between institutions. We saw with the crisis that all institutions wanted to show that they have the flexibility, that they are adaptable, that they can they can really uh, very quickly adapt to the new circumstances, and they did that. And there's, there's two different things that they did, right? It's not only the virtual hearings that we're talking about, it's also 
the fact that disputes are ongoing, that there are emergency situations, so you have emergency arbitrator proceedings, um, parties are continuing to file and to bring new arbitration claims. So it's important for institutions to continue and continue business as usual, allow those filings, um, allow those filings within the deadlines that, that exist um, under each set of rules and, and make sure that this is effective right, for, for parties. And that's what we saw from institutions, what fantastic work, frankly, regarding every institution that I've worked with as counselor, as arbitrator, I've really been impressed with the adaptability. Virtual hearings is a different matter. And I do want to address Patas's point on this. Um, um, institutions have all picked up on the challenge. Um, they have, uh, and, and there, I think there was a question on platforms and, and what's used. Each institution may have a preference or, or e either for a platform because of their own constraints, that's the case for ICSID. Um, others work with different service providers, um, but they have also tackled this. And I do want to address the, the point um, of Article 25, uh, two of the ICC rules. And here I'm speaking in my capacity as vice president of the ICC court, uh, which is that um, it, the, as the ICC guide has been published and has shown, there is no, um, constraint within today's rules, which says in person. So you can have an in-person hearing, you can have um, an in-person hearing through a virtual hearing to the extent that it will be um, uh, adversarial and it will allow for due process. So the in-person is not incompatible with uh, in virtual. And that's already the interpretation that the ICC has taken that is reflected in the guideline and um, notwithstanding that, there is a discussion at the ICC level to, 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 to dis consider whether we can dispense of that rule altogether because simply the, the, you know, this is the flexibility that the rules allow. Um, so institutions will look at it from one perspective, tribunals, and now addressing your, your point, um, um, Egle, um, are looking at it from their own perspective, right? Tribunals are, uh, have a duty to the parties to conduct the procedure effectively making sure that your process is, is um, uh, complied with and, and to uh, not delay things too much. Whereas parties and counsel see it from their own perspective, which is they really want the best, the most effective process for their own case as they see it and the interest of the case as they see it. So the, the approach is not the same for, for the different parties. Now, talking about the powers, and I think there were two, two questions on this. One is, um, what the tribunal should do if one party refuses. I think that there, there was a question about consent. Um, I don't think that this, it, this old circumstance, new circumstance changes anything in the powers of the tribunal. Tri tribunals are there to conduct the proceeding in an effective manner and respecting due process. To the extent that they do that, um, the, the fact that the modality of the uh, hearing is virtual is just a detail to some extent. So again, and that goes to the point that Tadas made, it's very important, and Emmanuel also made that point, it's a case by case analysis, right? It, every case is specific. So it's not a problem to have a virtual hearing for a case management at the beginning or a procedural hearing at the beginning where it's just parties arguing, even though in a recent matter where I was sitting as arbitrator, we had connect, connection issues and we ended up having all counsel connecting through phone. And even then the phone was not doing great and the connection was not ideal and optimal. And it was difficult to hear some of the, some of the parties. So, so you do have the technological challenge, but, but assuming that everything goes well, then um, it's, it's a question of just making sure that you know, due process is, 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 is respected and for, case specific for a very large case, which is complex, we have lots of experts and witnesses. It's not the same as having a short, a short hearing with just oral argument. So um, that is conducting the proceeding and, and having in mind the party's concern of due process. So if one party is saying, no, I do not want a virtual hearing and the other party says, yes, I do want, then you have, you're in the classic circumstance where the two parties disagree and the tribunal has to make a decision based on the uh, argument of the parties as to what is right and what is 
um, in compliance with due process concerns and equality of the parties, and that's very important. But that again is fact specific. I think personally, as as you know, um, taking you know when I'm acting as arbitrator, I think it's much more difficult for a tribunal to push for a uh, virtual hearing of both parties are, are um, against it because both parties are saying that given the way that they see the, the case and, and the interest of the case and due process under that case, a virtual hearing would not serve purpose of justice. So in that circumstance, I think that it's more difficult to, to, for the tribunal to push for virtual hearing. I think it's a different thing to say that it doesn't have the power. I think it has the power to, to push for a virtual hearing. The fact that it will decide that it is opportune or not, and if it's the right thing to do under the circumstances, that's a different matter. So the, the point of the powers, I think that tribunals have very broad powers, the way that they exercise that power is a very different matter. And that really is case specific and depends on the facts of every case. I'll stop here, Egle. I have more to say on other topics. Okay, thank you very much, yes. Um, now I would like to ask Velos, um, do you have some general remarks after you heard all the presentations? And also maybe afterwards, a, a very short specific one. So please share your thoughts. Thank you, thank you, Agle. And uh, yeah, my general remark after hearing the presentations is that uh, is thank you very much. This is uh, really very interesting and uh, uh, very good insights. Uh, you know, I'll go into the topic. I, I was really fascinated to hear, and I can see a lot of comments going around uh, in the chat box, which means that, uh, that, that uh, the public is also engaged. Um, and uh, we've been, you know, this is a, a totally unexpected, or well, people argue that somebody expected that uh, a pandemic may be coming, but uh, the, the way the COVID played out is not something that anybody could plan and it's totally new situation and it uh, will require adaptability but i think arbitration generally it's in the arbitration's dna to adapt arbitration has been a creation of of, uh, of businesses uh, a way to decide business disputes not necessarily using the state courts so it's not a kind of a nice substitute for, for state courts. It's, it's a sui generis uh, world right now, a sui generis procedure, and, and uh, arbitration will adapt, I'm sure. So I think it's, it's a great time for arbitration because adap adaptability will be needed. I just saw the US Supreme Court is having hearings uh, over teleconference. Uh, that there's a bit of conservatism there, you know, a teleconference, not, not Zoom or, or something. Uh, and, uh, and of course, there are lots of challenges, lots of technical challenges, lots of uh, procedural challenges. But, and these will have to be somehow met because uh, uh, it's pretty obvious that uh, uh, the life, even after the crisis, it won't come back to, you know, like it was uh, on the New Year's Eve uh, of 2020, as, as uh, was discussed. So, but arbitration is, is well placed to adapt because this is the name of the game in arbitration, to be flexible and to find solutions where they are necessary. And, you know, to put my small idea or small advice, and I don't know, maybe other speakers will, will, will be speaking. I think there's a big difference in adapting an ongoing process and new processes, because there is an issue of, uh, of expectations. And I think uh, if, uh, if the party is starting a dispute right now, the claimant is preparing a claim, they may plan for having uh, to hear witnesses on video or for having, you know, then the emphasis on the witness testimony may be placed differently. They may plan for the tactics of how the things are presented. And so, so for them, the playing field is a kind of, is kind of level playing field. If, for example, the rules are changed now, they, they will adapt. But for parties who are in the middle of a big dispute and they planned for, for the hearing, they were running up to, to the hearing as the, the kind of big, a big battleground and uh, where they will deliver their cases. Of course, this change now to virtual hearings or whatever changes is really, really sensitive. So my little proposal would be that why don't arbitration community agree to prioritize ongoing procedures as to live hearings? and to actually 
to uh, suggest that virtual hearings are considered for new procedures, like leaving time for the ongoing procedures to be able to finish uh, with an with a in-person hearing. That's it for me for now. <laughs> Thank you, Willis. Uh, we have another question from Veronica about cross-examination of witnesses. So it would be interesting to hear some thoughts on this issue. Um, for example, if parties uh, have agreed upon the virtual hearings and the key witness does not agree uh, to be cross-examined uh, examined uh, through the virtual platform, what should the parties do? And uh, maybe someone would like to start sharing their thoughts on this topic. Tadas, maybe? <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, it's a very interesting question. Uh, what to do if, if the witness does not agree to show in the virtual hearing? Uh, I would say, and my opinion is, uh, the same should be done uh, as it would be done if witness uh, does not agree to show up for, for let's say, normal hearing. Uh, uh, of course, virtual hearings now, we presented them as something different from, uh, from I use this phrase again, normal hearings, but uh, in terms of legal regulation, I believe we do not have any arbitration laws uh, providing uh, different regulation for virtual hearings and normal hearings. So I believe the same should be done uh, in, as in the situation when the, when the witness disagrees to show up for, for the normal hearing and then uh, one of the one of the options available to the tribunal probably is to ask assistance of uh, the courts of the arbitration seat. But yeah, that in the future, that's also one of the issues that might need some, some guidance uh, from, again, institutions, lawgivers of different countries. But for, for now, I, I, I wouldn't see a big difference in these two situations. That would be my opinion. Thank you. And um, Professor uh, Emmanuel Kaya, during your introduction, you said that you had witness examination online. So how did you know that the witness uh, was alone and there was no one assisting? And uh, what approach did you take? Well, it was a situation pre-COVID. So we had made sure that a representative of the other side would be present in the room, which was the classic way to ensure that uh, there is no no fraud or no no problem there. So you you have the the other side send someone, or if they don't have anyone in the country in question, some friendly independent firm they would work with, uh, just sit there, make sure that there is no problem so that's an easy that's an easy uh, problem to solve and today with technology we have the 360 cameras we have other ways of ensuring that so I'm not too worried about that the the, the real problem with uh, virtual cross-examination is do you get the reaction uh, which you expect do you have a very sterile discussion or people lecturing and if 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 i think it's probably easier for a witness uh, to stonewall uh, remotely and give long speeches you cannot interrupt the witness you cannot say you have to be patient you have to ask can i interrupt uh, to the chair i mean it's really really difficult if uh, it, it takes a lot of good faith. Of course, uh, there are many situations in which uh, a lot of good faith to make it happen properly. And there are many situations in which, in which it's, it's, it would be very hard. Now, in this case, just to, to um, tell you why uh, I authorized this is simply because 
you know, the tribunal felt that these were very minor witnesses, uh, the cost uh, benefit to have them travel just to to validate a two-page uh, affidavit saying, yes, I confirm this, uh, was very, very uh, limited. So that's why we decided to have them remote. But I think that should be more, um, more and more often the case because you have three options for the tribunal when you have with the case. I don't need to hear them. This, you know, I don't need to call everybody or we don't need to hear everybody in the, in the opinion of the tribunal. You know, we want to hear X, Y, Z, but not these guys. But you can say this one, we can, I, I hope that in the future you can, you can have three options. You can say, we want to hear these key witnesses live. We want, we may want to hear these witnesses remote, uh, remotely. And, um, and, and maybe the, the, this category, unless the parties uh, agree, otherwise we're not really interested. Uh, and I agree with Talas that the uh, solution is not necessarily new guidelines, new, new uh, fury reglementaire, uh, but it's, it's, it's simply the rules of due process, equality of the parties. In PO number one, you probably have a rule saying what happens if a, if a witness is reluctant, doesn't want to come, and, and refusing to, to be heard remotely through a certain technique, which has been chosen by the tribunal, is, as, as I said, equivalent to refusing to participate. And in that case, the tribunal can assess the, 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 the situation in light of what the rules say and what, what the rules of the game have been. Um, decided, which are generally would be uh, the tribunal can assess the property value in light of the circumstances, but or, or possibly strike from the record um, the, the witness uh, testimony. Uh, so I don't think it's a very difficult situation, but I think I think generally it would give options to, to the fact that if we practice that for long enough, it would give options for the future. In, in to discriminate between what's really important to have life and what what's uh, secondary and possibly uh, organized remotely. So that with the split hearings, because I think it will change the tradition uh, on that as well. That's that that's something which may be changed by this uh, window of uh, COVID times. Now, one thing which I've seen uh, maybe to clear the air for some. Um, I've seen a question from a participant, has nothing to do with this, but maybe I can take this opportunity to say that. Uh, the Milan Chamber of Commerce does organize, um, does organize uh, hearings. Uh, they, they, they are an arbitral institution who organize hearings. They, 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 can, they, they have different things. The Milan Club is a, is, a, is a discussion forum, but the Milan Chamber of Commerce can, can um, and does supervise hearings in some cases. So, so if there is ambiguity there, a participant clarified it, and I think rightly right so. Thank you. It shows that there is a big competition between the institutions and everybody wants to capitalize on the situation and say, I'm, I'm capable of organizing things very efficiently. So, so that's, that's, a, that's a good thing. The competition is among institutions is a good thing. Yes, uh, thank you. And maybe, yes, uh, would you uh, like to add something on the issue related to witness coaching? Thank you, um, Egle. Picking up where Manu left it, I think that it's good to have options as always. Um, and I also welcome the option, but having options is not the same as going for standardization. So in the sense that because we can have virtual hearings, therefore everybody will now have virtual hearings regardless of the circumstances, one side fits all, and therefore everybody will be doing the same. I think it's very important to keep in mind that every case is specific and tribunals have a duty to the parties to ensure that when they make decisions, this is fit for that case and for the, the requirements of due process and equality of the parties in that case. So one size does not fit all. Um, on, the, on, on, on your question, I think that it, it can be a true challenge. Um, I, pre-COVID, as, as, as an arbitrator, I was in a situation where 
the witness, one of the main witnesses was examined by video. So as we said from the outset, this has existed for some time. It's not new to COVID, we're just expanding, right? So in that circumstance, unlike Emmanuel's case, in that case, it was just the lawyers for the side that were presenting that witness. In other words, there's not, there was not opposing counsel in the same room. This far, was a, a very far away country and it was just the lawyers who were presenting the witness being in the room. At some point during the evidence um, uh, hearing and during the examination, we realized that there may be papers going around under the guise of translation and the that the witness was receiving notes and written notes that um, that witness should not have received. It was not clear what was happening and not having anyone in the room checking and making sure and showing us what this was and with the uh, things being lost in translation it was very difficult to, to, to actually conduct that process and ensure that we were not being unfair to the party and the witness, but at the same time we're making sure that th there's no coaching going on and, 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 and what's, what's happening there. So I think it's very important that, again, tribunals, when they make decisions, first of all, decide whether or not this is fit for the case um, that they're considering. With everything that we said, right, and, and the Tadas made some of those points, right, with the time difference being an issue, concentration being an issue, um, easy versus complex, right, some cases, construction can be split, but, um, commercial matters, investment matters cannot be split sometimes. So it really depends on the complexity of the case and what you can do and what's fair to the parties. To the extent that the tribunal decides that it will conduct a hearing virtually, then the question is how they're going to look at the witness issue. And that highest standards of scrutiny, I think, will be welcome for tribunals to put everything in place to make sure that there is no... Um, coaching going around, um, that uh, there is nothing improper being done between counsel and witness or between witness and persons who are not counsel team, but simply other people. And it's simply impossible to double check. And I want to just seize this opportunity to respond to Shen Ming's question, who says that whether this will or may encourage guerrilla tactic, and it's true, it may. I, I don't rule out that you may have, you know, witnesses who are not playing the game, who want to be difficult, to take the opportunity of having the, the remote and the virtual to, and, you know, with the difficulty of connectivity to raise issues or difficulties when there's none. And that you would not have in a... Uh, live physical uh, hearing with everybody in the same room. So that can happen, absolutely. And I think that that's the reason why tribunals have to be extremely cautious when there's uh, the question of witness and expert examination, how they will conduct that proceeding and how they will make sure that there is nothing improper going on. And there are tools, the 360 degree camera, that's all fine, but that doesn't say anything about what happens at the break, what happens when the witness leaves the room, who he or she talks to, how they can be coached, um, whether or not they have an iPhone or, or a smartphone through which they can receive coaching. So it's really important to for tribunals to put in place a very high standard of scrutiny as to how they're going to uh, conduct the proceeding. Thank you for your interesting thoughts. Uh, Velos, I would like to ask about the future of arbitration. Do you believe that after the COVID, more parties will consider an arbitration as a primary method to, of dispute resolution? Could the finan uh, finance crisis have an impact on that? including what kind of disputes can be expect, expected in arbitration. Thank you, Agla. I, I think uh, it's a great question. And of course, I don't have a single answer. This is a question about the future. And, and, uh, uh, but uh, just to take it to try, I think the answer depends on how arbitration community will react, how the institutions will be adapting, how, they will, how we will all do our job. Uh, because arbitration uh, is a matter of uh, free choice. So it is kind of in an open market. Uh, we, we have to stay the best choice if we want to be uh, interesting. Uh, 
uh, as, as uh, arbitrators, as arbitration community. So for me, I think uh, definitely, I, I, I think that uh, COVID will change life. And uh, after the COVID, we will come back into a different situation and we will need to adapt uh, in one way or another, probably, uh, uh, you know, if the, the life will not go exactly to where it was. And probably, uh, you know, we will have uh, challenges like the costs, uh, as Emmanuel mentioned, is a big challenge and people will be looking for, for easier solutions. And, uh, and maybe arbitration can go into that direction a little bit to, you know, making the procedures more uh, moving to, to, to more of these mixed mediation and arbitration scenarios or maybe mediation in general might uh, pick up. And, and uh, become more popular. But at the same time, uh, as I said, I think the arbitration is really, uh, it's, its biggest benefit is flexibility. Flexibility means uh, that people can come up with ideas which are totally new and can uh, implement them relatively quickly compared to implementing new ideas in, in some other spheres. So the, uh, I would say th there's a good chance that arbitration will be really popular in the future still. And, uh, you know, like we, we were discussing now, uh, of course, these virtual hearings are really difficult to imagine. If you imagine the, them, uh, you know, with the means like we have now, even uh, whatever, it, it's, it's really a small wonder, uh, these uh, technologies that enable this kind of webinars. But of course, they are not there. They are not enough to be able to fully watch a witness and so on. But maybe in the future, maybe we will have service providers now we have hearing centers maybe we will have remote hearing centers maybe we will have then maybe the answer will depend if if uh, for example the parties are in in uh, uh, lithuania and the united states and both have certified service providers who can come to the witnesses premises who can ensure technical uh, separation who can ensure technical connectivity issues that are not used or abused as was a, a good comment from, from one of the participants. Then uh, this can happen. Then maybe in some other circumstances, no. Maybe in some other circumstances, you need another solution. So I think uh, we will see a lot of changes uh, uh, after this crisis uh, in arbitration also. Thank you, Velos. Emmanuel, uh, Fabiana and, Vel and Velos just mentioned um, about mediation. and. Also, our audience is asking, should international business consider mediation more than arbitration, particularly after Singapore Convention was signed? So could you please um, uh, comment on this one? Yes, uh, I'm happy to. I, I, well, the, the Singapore Convention is interesting, but I don't think it changes much. I mean, it, it, mediation is important and um, will continue to to be important. Uh, I know for a fact that certain mediations are ongoing, and I would say that it's probably easier for a mediation to take place remotely than uh, an actual arbitration. Of course, the rules are different. You may have the mediator talking separately to different parties, so you have to organize it differently. But as the result is not binding, it's not it's more flexible and there is when people are engaged in the mediation probably they have a spirit which is conducive to using uh, new technologies and you don't have to be that suspicious what happens is if the if the person goes to the other room uh, for uh, 15 minutes would, would, would the person the witness be coached or what so you you don't have these problems so yes it takes place now it's, uh, it takes place uh, efficiently with uh, the new technologies and, and in a remote way. After the crisis, may mediation will continue to be uh, valued. But of course, there are cases where uh, parties cannot agree either directly or through a mediation, and then they will need a, a hard dispute resolution mechanism and arbitration, as you said, is probably better suited for that, given the flexibility and the, the, the way it can be organized than any, any court uh, 
and court system in a given um, part of the world. So, so yes, we'll see more mediation, we'll see more arbitration, and, uh, and, and it's a good thing, but we will see something quite different. And if it's the last time you give me the floor, I'd like to leave the participants um, with the concept of arbitral waste. I would like all of us to make an effort to avoid arbitral waste. I can provide pictures of hearing rooms filled with binders and every arbitrator has at least 10 copies of the same, same documents in, with a new binder for each uh, witness and the same documents are repeated over and over again in the same binders. We all saw that and I call it arbitral waste and I would like all of us to make and the arbitral community to make an effort because this is uh, less and less acceptable by those who are uh, con cost conscious, uh, of course, environmental uh, conscious, and uh, on every aspect of it, it's it's something we should avoid. And I hope that one of the good things this crisis will bring to the arbitration uh, community is to be more conscious and and uh, more more sensitive to avoid arbitral waste. Thank you. Uh, I can see that uh, there are a lot of people asking about confidentiality and privacy issues of virtual hearings. So maybe, yes, um, would you like to share your thoughts on this topic? Thank you, Egle. Um, what I've seen so far is that um, there are a number of platforms that are being used um, there, there's two different things. Either there's, there's, you know, Zoom is one that some hearings have been have been using, and it's a very easy one that we're using right now. So that that's that that's one platform. But there have been criticism about security of the platforms. So you have some institution. Exit is one. Uh, Exit uh, uses Webex, uh, which is a compatible system with the World Bank system, and they they have made sure that this is something that allows security of the process. Um, some uh, other um, platforms are also discussed, uh, Microsoft Teams, Blue Jean, and so forth. So everybody talks about a different platform. I think that, the, and, and then you have what I think was really was mentioning in Tadas as well, was to what extent you will have service providers and hearing virtual hearing service providers offering their own platform and offering the, the confidentiality of that platform. Um, it, it is a serious issue. Um, what we're seeing is that some companies simply refuse um, platforms such as Zoom because this is this is not a secure platform um, to their understanding and belief. So uh, confidentiality will be an issue and will be an issue that tribunals need to take into account. What I've seen so far is that they rely heavily on, on arbitral, arbitral institutions, of course, to make that assessment and for institutions to work hand in hand with their own providers and with their own um, counterparts to ensure that the confidentiality of the process is ensured and that there cannot be any hacking or any, any issues of confidentiality. But that's that's the real challenge where it's just the beginning of the process and, and we will see, I think this is a space where we will see a lot of evolution um, from the service providers in the coming months. Can I say something on Zoom? I defended the Milan Chamber of Commerce, now I'm defending Zoom. There is Zoom and Zoom. Zoom can be the Zoom you, you install from, the, you know, just anybody can use, but you can secure Zoom. Uh, I find it particularly flexible. I, I, personally, I like it a lot. But, but you can make you, a, a different use of Zoom and, and make it uh, more secure. Now, nothing is really secure if you are coming, you know, if you're talking about... Uh, some security services from countries or whatever of the FSB, nothing is secure, but, but, but that's life, you know, it was not secure before anyway. Thank you. And in the end, Fabiana, what would be your thoughts on this issue? Um, I agree with all the expositions. I would only add that um, according to the guidelines I mentioned before, and they suggest that, well, I mean, there's, there will always be a risk of um, privacy, uh, 
violation, right? So it is important that all parties are um, in the same page in the ARPTA tribunal, that everyone agrees. And there's a record that everyone is agreeing on the platform that is being used and of all the risks that exist. So I think that, will, that could be useful. Thank you, and, and India, do you have something to share? I think a lot of zombie steps, so I'll keep it short. Speaking from the Indian perspective, confidentiality recently was, was put in the statute books. So arbitration has to be confidential. But if you look at from privacy and security concerns, our privacy laws are not as stringent as GDPR or some other laws. That being said, yes, every software has its issues, but it can be minimized. For example, WebEx is a good software, Teams is a good software. In fact, in our course, we're using mostly WebEx and Teams. So I think you can, pref you can take preference of some softwares that are more, or which are better in terms of security, and use that to reduce your, your security, privacy, and confidentiality concerns. Thank you. Um... Yes, so I can see that our time is running out and we will answer the last question before finishing it. And Velus, um, you said in the beginning of this webinar that it was born um, as a webinar for uh, young arbitration practitioners and you said that we all are young. So in your opinion, what is the future of arbitration for young um, arbitration practitioners? Do you speak expect um, these young practitioners to become more important or technology will change us? Uh, clearly, uh, you know, always the, the changes and the and new technologies are always providing a lot of opportunities for, for young people. But as I said, uh, we are all young. So, you know, it's not like uh, just the age defines uh, being young. That's the, uh, that was my, my premise in the beginning. But definitely there is a lot of uh, opportunity, I think, uh, because the changes uh, are, of course, they, they are a challenge for everyone, but they are also a chance, for, also for everyone. And uh, the people who have now new ideas and new energies uh, have a lot of, uh, have a lot of uh, things to come and, and to look forward to. I would like to say about security, you know, I think uh, it's absolutely crucial issue and uh, we know that no system is fully secure. But on the other hand, some of uh, my colleagues have told me that no building is also absolutely secure. Uh, we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't uh, you know, since it's COVID and now it's very topical, um, we shouldn't kind of uh, uh, demonize, uh, if I may use the word, only the platforms on IT. Uh, it's, it's really scary to listen to some of the security people, how they tell you they can listen through glasses and through walls and through everything to what's happening in the building. So it's not, it's not a specific challenge of IT. Of course, this uh, being online makes it easier to access uh, without travel, but this is the challenge we will have to face. And, uh, and uh, by the way, Zoom is, is providing a great uh, service for the for, for webinars, and, and uh, nobody broke in yet. So, <laughs> thank you, Velos. Uh, if there are some unanswered uh, questions, they may be, um, might be forwarded to us via email, and we are happy to answer them or share our thoughts. And well, I would like to thank all the speakers, participants uh, of our webinar. It was my pleasure to be a part of it. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed it, uh, found it interesting and useful. Also, don't miss our upcoming webinars. And with that being said, thank you once again for joining us. Enjoy the rest of the day and goodbye. Thank you, goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.